Oh, it's going. Waiting for the stream to go live. Hey, look, we're live. Uh, so, yeah, this is mildly terrifying. Um, thought I'd try a little bit of a new test of something. This is actually because I had a video that I was going to record tonight and edit and get out for tomorrow until I realized this morning that the date that was sort of the anniversary of what I was going after was today, not tomorrow, which would have been cool because it would have been on Halloween and all that stuff. Um, so hopefully this is working. Never actually done any of the live streaming stuff except for SparkCon, and that was just on a little, you know, pie that was set up to do it with really uh, no configuration. So, yeah, um, this really kind of all started because I recently got a new 3D printer and started thinking about, wow, you know, we had a, a MakerBot Replicator 2 that we bought about four years ago, and I've now got a new one four years later, and it was cost less, just about the same price, but a little bit less, and had a ton of new features. And I started kind of going down the rabbit hole of, you know, how are these things moving this fast and why did everything start when it did? So, uh, and I just realized I still have OBS up. I'm an idiot. Um, better with the background. Like I said, this is completely new. Um, so instead, I want to talk about patent 5121329. I know. Just a universal groan, I'm sorry. Um, but this patent's actually really cool, and today is the eighth anniversary of it expiring, as all patents do uh, 20 years after they're initially filed. I'm not actually after they're issued. As you notice, it's, uh, it was issued on June 9th, uh, 1992, but it was uh, October 30th of 2009 that this expired. And this is the Stratasys FDM, or Fusion Deposition Modeling Patent. Um, you probably be familiar with some of those words if you're at all familiar with 3D printing, as I was just talking about. Stratasys is the, you know, the, the great granddaddy of 3D printing. They were the company that came up with it. And they are the ones that filed the initial patent for that process that most consumer grade and even a lot of, obviously, uh, professional and industrial grade 3D printers use. And if we look down at some of these images, some things are going to start to look a little bit interesting and similar, despite the fact that they're, you know, over 20 years old at this point, uh, 28. Um, so, you know, obviously this is not exact, but you can kind of see it looks a little bit like a sewing machine on first glance, but uh, you can see it's kind of printing off a little object down here at the bottom, this labeled 40A, which is the item that it's printing. Um, things get more interesting as we go into it, and so here's sort of the the way that the nozzle works. So you've got filament coming in, going through a hot end, coming out a nozzle. So again, that's FDM, or Fusion Deposition Modeling. Um, kind of continuing on with it, uh, again, got a spool of filament here, going up through a tube. You know, there's a lot of sort of the Bowden-style printers that print that way, going through a nozzle which extrudes it, and out, and you've got the object. So you know, why is this important? Um, before this patent expired, the only people that could do this was Stratasys. You know, they're the only company that could make that. And they're still a huge name in the game. They actually, well, I'll get to this more later, but they've bought out some of the sort of smaller, um, you know, consumer level people. And the fact that we've had so much progress in the last eight years is because of this one patent and really nothing beyond that. Uh, I mean, obviously there's, it, it would have happened regard, you know, some of this, the advancements would have happened regardless, but with, if this patent was still in place, we couldn't have done that. Um, and it was actually slightly before to eight years ago that people started working on it, but obviously they couldn't sell it. So to kind of go back, um, We've got the RepRap project. So this was started at, I believe, MIT? No, University, sorry, I got it completely wrong. The University of Bath. And these look kind of, you know, these look ancient and arcane, but if you kind of get closely looking at them, they're actually relatively familiar. Um, so this is kind of a closer up view of it, and this is the, the RepRap Darwin. So the intent here was to use the FDM process to be
be able to print parts, to print new printers, to print bigger printers that would be able to, you know, make just about anything you could possibly want using the FDM process. And this was started, I think, two years before the patent actually expired, 2007, or maybe even a little bit before that. Um, but obviously they couldn't sell it. This is just sort of a university thing. It's, you know, a little harder to kind of get slapped with patent lawsuits if you're working on something at a university level, you're not commercializing it. And, I, you know, they weren't at the time. Um, yeah, you know, I think that they were kind of looking to the future knowing that that patent was going to expire and wanting to be able to kind of get ahead of the game and go from there. So if you look at this one, this is actually, there's kind of a couple of different sort of styles of printers that you'll see. So as I said, this is the Darwin, and it's kind of hard to tell unless you know what you're looking at. But the build plate that's kind of in the middle here actually rides up and down, and that's where you see these four pulleys uh, around the bottom. Two of them are obscured, they're all connected with a belt, and as those pulleys turn, they turn some screws and raise the bed up and down. Um, the other sort of style, which is, now this is zoomed in too large, is this style, where, again, it's, I just kind of noticed because I'm looking at it, but the bed itself moves in and out and is the y-axis and the in the previous one it's the z-axis and the the extruder head rides on the x and the z-axis itself so most fdm 3d printers these days are sort of these two styles and these are the genesis of that i mean they're you know kind of very basic everything's threaded rod everything's 3d printed parts and this just really amazed me at how far we've come from that. So you've got these. Um, so this is sort of that, uh, well, there's the, the Darwin style that I mentioned, which is the Z, the bed is the Z-axis, and then the Mendel style. So this was the RepRap Mendel. Um, one of the, I don't think this is the first, first version, but it was one of the originals. Um, and then that kind of brings over to like the one that I just bought. This is the Formrex T-Rex, FormBot T-Rex 2 Plus, and it is a Mendel style. So the the x-axis rides up on the the z-screws and the bed is the y-axis and moves in and out. I mean it's basically the same thing except for, as you know, we've got dual extruders on here <laughs> um, which is obviously kind of one of the bigger things that came in. Now we've had that for a while but just to kind of go through a couple of the differences on these, I mean this one pretty much it can move in X, Y, and Z, and it squirts out plastic onto the, the build plate to print what you need. Um, leveling was manual, you know, basically every little fine-tuning, tweaking thing you possibly ever wanted to do was completely manual. Go back to some of the newer ones, like the FormBot that I got, and again, this is not an ad for them, it's just, this is an example because this is what I have. Um, and some of the, some of these differences even exist in like the printers that we, you know, that we've used before. So we had a MakerBot Replicator 2. And that one, in all honesty, is in terms of features, isn't a whole lot different from the Darwin right, right here. It's got a bed that moves on the Z-axis. The extruder is on the XY gantry on top. And it put, puts plastic onto a build plate. There's no real sensing. There's nothing else. It was, you know, in a much nicer construction and build. And that was, you know, around 2012. So, you know, about five or six years after these were originally designed, but in reality, not a whole much beyond, not a whole lot much beyond that. Whereas with something like this, which obviously is more the Mendel style, it has the dual extrusion. In this case, it's actually independent dual extrusion, which is really something that's only come out in like the last six months. I think uh, the BCN 3D Sigma is doing uh, independent dual or IDEX, as they've uh, come to call it extrusions, which allows you to kind of do some uh, interesting things like duplicate printing um, or mirrored printing where the, you know, they can move independently of each other, but in exactly opposite ways to just sort of mirror an object over. Um, but not only do they have automatic leveling now, they've got what's called mesh leveling or tramming, where it, at least in the case of this particular printer, it probes 255 points on the bed and then you can actually watch the z-axis as it's printing and it's ever so slightly coming up and down to take care of any you know wobble or waves or you know angle in your bed um they well this one doesn't in particular but a lot of them will have filament sensors now 
Um, they're obviously much larger, larger, much more sturdy construction. Um, they have far more advanced firmware that enables you to do, you know, faster printing, um, you know, so, uh, sorry, um, more accurate printing. I'm sure that while the original rep wraps, you know, were great in concept, you're not getting the high quality that you're getting now, the accuracy that you're getting. Obviously, a lot of these printers have, you know, Wi-Fi and, you know, some of them I've even, have, even seen have had Bluetooth and have, you know, apps to control them and all those things. And there's all these, you know, new features and new abilities that they can do. I mean, there's even some out there that have automatic 3D scanning built into them to then duplicate an object, which is a little bit silly. But, you know, hey, it works. And also, the price has come down. I mean, a printer this size was completely out of any consumer's reach. I mean, I know this is, you know, we, we run a business, we do Maniac Labs, but like this was a personal personal purchase for me. And, you know, that I would have never been able to purchase even four or five years ago. This would have been in the tens of thousands of dollars to have something that had a 16 by 16 by 20 build volume. It's just absolutely insane. So what I'm trying to get at here and stumbling at because I'm live and it's weird is that, you know, I understand why companies want patents. They want to protect what they've invested in, and that's fine. And there's a lot that I could get into with how the current patent system is broken and all that. But I just want to take the time to point out that on this eighth anniversary of the Stratasys FDM patent expiring, we have so much more than we did eight years ago, ten years ago, that... You know, just imagine where 3D, everyone talks about everyone having a 3D printer in their home. You know, if the patent had expired 20 years ago or 25 years ago instead, I think we'd probably be a lot closer there. Um, and just to kind of go sort of back through the history a little bit more, um, well, here's another uh, version of printer, which this is just sort of yet another one of the many styles you'll see. But I mean, there's basically a few. There's the Darwin, the Bendel, and uh, this, which actually I'm not, I can't remember what they call it the warmer rod i guess um but more commonly you'll see the uh, printer bot and the printer bot simple use this uh, style of setup uh so then we can get to something like this MakerBot. I, I said i'd mentioned stratasys and who they who they purchased before so really i think this is sort of the the darling of the consumer 3d printing industry um and this is where that patent expiration comes in. Now, obviously, the guys at the University of Bath developed the rep wrap and, you know, were able to do that before the patent expired, but obviously they couldn't sell it. And they probably had to be pretty careful with what they did with it, lest, you know, Stratus just come in and try to ban what they're doing um, or, you know, take legal action or whatever. But so this is the Cupcake CNC and, you know, it was made by MakerBot. I think it was released in 2010. And this was really the first one that you could legitimately buy. So again, you know, just seeing how far we've come. I and mean, this is all laser cut wood and whatnot. I mean, this is only even a few few years removed from like the Darwin. And it's already, you know, kind of a lot more nicely packaged. Everything looks, you know, goes together well. It is definitely sort of a tinkerer's kit. Um, I believe it actually was a kit you had to assemble. Uh, unfortunately, didn't have one of these way back then. I mean, the build volume is tiny. I, mean, I think, you know, it's only a few inches um, square, but you could actually 3D print things on your own, and that's insane. And, you know, so this was the one that started all of it, um, enabled people to finally start seeing, oh, hey, you know, 3D printing is actually making it in the consumer's hands, and it's at an affordable cost. Uh, so then kind of coming up into, you know, further things, along like the Mendel line, we've got obviously the Prusa, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, again, like I said, this is sort of the, the Mendel style. Um, but this was one of the first ones, I believe in about 2012, which brought it into the metal construction. It was a little bit nicer, the kind of thing you could kind of put down and not really worry too much that it's, it's going to work. Obviously, then around the same time, MakerBot came out with the Replicator 2, which was uh, you know, the, the Replicator 1 was a little bit more like the Cupcake CNC. It was all wood construction, uh, so it wasn't quite as sturdy and quite as tight. The Replicator 2, though, we've been using for four years, and it's an absolute workhorse. It's great. 
Um, it's, you know, that all metal steel construction definitely helps everything stay in line and stay running true. And MakerBot was definitely one of the first ones where their software with MakerWare was, you know, pretty nice and the, just a general consumer could use. Obviously, though, then we get into, again, you know, where closing things up hurts stuff is MakerBot closed sourced everything with the release of the Replicator 2. They closed off their firmware. They closed off their, you know, front end UI for the slicer. They closed off the designs for the printer, which stinks. Um, but fortunately, everything was before then was already open source. And it's astonishing to me. Again, this is just in eight, you know, eight, ten years. Um this is just sort of the, the, the firmware known by the RepRap project. So one, the MakerBot runs off of, well, a variant of Sailfish. Sailfish was basically what they took and made when MakerBot closed sourced everything. But a ton of printers, probably the most that I've seen these days, unless they've got some really super fancy, you know, touchscreen UI or whatever, run off of uh, Marlin. Um, which, again, I want to note, you know, obviously we love open source here. If you ever find a printer and it runs off of, you know, sort of a basic type of firmware and the company is not giving away the source for that, maybe not necessarily for the printer itself, but for the firmware, um, there, you need to call them out uh, because Marlin and others are generally GPL or something similar to that. And they are required to, to uh, come out with the firmware on that. So, I'm rambling on at this point. I mean, I guess what we kind of come to is something like this. Just I wanted to point out, this is another thing that made me start thinking about how crazy it is, how far we've come. So you've got the original, uh, where did I find it? The original Mendel. I mean, this is like the genesis of the Prusa i3 line of printers. And then we come into... This one, which is the Mark III, which was just announced. Um, not only does this have all of the you know automatic bed leveling and, and filament sensing and all of that stuff, but they've got crazy things in there where it, it'll automatically save shut down and during a power loss and restart your print. It's got a build plate where the everything pops right off. You know, it it um, detects the the does all the filament sensing with basically an optical mouse sensor. So it not only knows that there's filament there, but it knows that it's moving. All of these things are coming into the 3D printers crazy fast. And, you know, even with the form bot that I've got, I'm, you know, there's, there's a ton of mods and, and upgrades to it that are just readily available because they all basically use the same parts. Um, so again, I ramble. I just wanted to kind of get out there <laughs> that, you know, if you're into 3D printing, thank the fact that the Stratasys patent expired. Oh, and yes, more rambling. I'm sorry. What I was trying to talk about with MakerBot was Stratasys ended up buying them. And they were part of, you know, the, I, all of the closed sourcing and all that stuff. And there was a bunch of controversies. And, you know, that, that could kind of get into a, a, a lot of different things. But, you know, I think Stratasys was still trying to kind of hang on to, to what they had with that. And they brought MakerBot back into the fold, you know, so they, they still do that sort, you know, they're, they're still working in that space, but the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, with the patent. So I don't think, I think they're going to need to keep innovating and, and, and uh, come up with either, you know, new 3D printing technologies or whatnot, although most of them at this point are, you know, the patents have expired. So without that, we wouldn't be where we are. We wouldn't, be where we're going to be in another 10, 20 years from now. And I'm just excited to see how that goes. So I'll stop rambling now. This is a test. Maybe I'll delete this. Maybe not. But uh, thanks for watching.